Hey guys, Amy with you, and I've had a lot of questions about breaking the sound barrier lately. Specifically, what exactly is going on when you break the sound barrier? Well, because this is vintage space, we're going to look at a little bit of the history of the problem of compressibility, and of course, talk about Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier in the X1. All right, let's start by running through the very basics of this problem. Even though you might not feel it when you are standing like me in a quiet room with no breeze, air actually is made up of molecules. And when you move through the air, or anything moves through the air, namely in this case an aircraft, all of those air molecules have to get out of the way. Now, if the air molecules can't get out of the way fast enough, they compress in front of the aircraft. And it's this compressibility that is wrapped up in the problem of breaking the sound barrier. Compressibility was an issue for physicists long before aircraft were flying faster than sound. In fact, it was an issue long before aircraft were flying, even. But it was always linked to the speed of sound. Physicists could study this looking at other objects that passed the speed of sound, namely a bullet leaving a gun. When physicists were able to capture images of a bullet traveling through a medium, they were able to actually visualize shockwaves building up in front of and behind the bullet, showing the physical mechanism of compressibility. Compressibility first became a problem in aviation when aircraft manufacturers and pilots were starting to notice that the tips of propeller blades were traveling faster than the speed of sound. Not only were the propeller blades rotating, but the aircraft was also moving forward. This meant that the tips of the blades were actually moving supersonically, and because of that, they were meeting the resistance of the compressed air, and this caused instability for an aircraft in flight. It became very obvious to aviation engineers pretty early on in the 1930s that compressibility was going to be an issue if aircraft were going to keep flying higher and faster. The problem became much more noticeable when jet aircraft replaced propeller planes because they were flying that much faster. Engineers and pilots knew that as a jet flew faster, the air traveling over the wing would hit supersonic speeds before the air traveling under the wing. This created a disturbance in airflow that could be devastating for the structure of an impact and ultimately could claim a pilot's life. And the most dangerous speed was just below the speed of sound. The speed of sound is Mach 1, but at around Mach 0.8, all of those forces from the shockwaves building up become very, very dangerous for the aircraft. The problem for engineers was that trying to figure out how to get an aircraft to fly faster than sound without falling apart because the shockwaves would rip it to pieces was not something that could be solved in a wind tunnel. The same way that these shockwaves build up around the aircraft and buffet it around and cause all these structural problems, the same thing happens in a wind tunnel because the tunnel bit means that all of those shockwaves are just bouncing around inside the tunnel, causing more instability and ultimately yielding really bad data. It became very clear in the early 1940s that the only way to figure out how to get an aircraft to fly faster than sound was to build an aircraft to fly faster than sound. Effectively, the sky would become the laboratory. And here we meet the X-1. Built by Bell Aircraft in the mid-1940s, it was designed after a bullet, because physicists knew that a bullet leaving the barrel of a gun flies faster than sound, therefore replicating that basic shape in an airplane with very stubby little wings and putting a rocket engine in it and filling most of its body with fuel was a surefire way to get an aircraft to fly faster than sound and hopefully not fall apart in the process. The X-1 was built by Bell Aircraft with help from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NASA's predecessor organization that was in the business of developing beautifully designed aircraft. And it was flown by pilots from the Army Air Force, which became the U.S. Air Force when it separated from the Army in 1947. To retain all of its fuel for the speed run trying to break the sound barrier, the X-1 was built to be launched from underneath the wing of a B-29 bomber. The mothership would be the one to carry the X-1 up to its launch altitude, leaving the pilot free to use all of his onboard fuel for the speed run to try to fly faster than sound. The X-1 flew its first glide flight unpowered in the early months of 1945. In September of 1946, a second X-1 was finished and this one had the rocket engine inside. And it was piloted by Chalmers Slick Goodlin, a Royal Canadian Air Force pilot turned civilian pilot for Bell Aircraft. Goodlin was the X-1's pilot. He was the one on deck to fly faster than sound in level flight for the first time ever in history. The problem was he also wanted $150,000 as a bonus to make that flight. He knew there were risks involved and he wanted to be compensated. This was a problem for both Bell and the Air Force and was ultimately enough of a sticking point that Goodlin lost his chance to fly the plane. 
To take his place, the Air Force interviewed eight volunteers. Among them was a young pilot named Chuck Yeager. He was the least experienced pilot flying at Edwards Air Force Base at the time, but he was known to be so instinctually good in the cockpit that he was given the chance to take Goodland's place and fly the X-1. And he did on October 14th of 1947. Just after 10.30 in the morning, at 20,000 feet, Jaeger in the X-1 fell away from the B-29. He put the aircraft into a slight nose-down orientation, then lit all four barrels of his rocket engine in rapid sequence. Shock diamonds appeared behind the aircraft as he hit Mach 0.08, then began to climb. Now in the transonic realm, Jaeger shut down two of his rocket barrels and tested the aircraft's control as the Mach meter showed he was still accelerating. Invisible shockwaves buffeted the wings as the aircraft reached 40,000 feet, and Jaeger relit one of his rocket barrels. Still monitoring his instruments, he watched and saw that his Mach meter moved slowly and smoothly from 0.98 to 1.02 before jumping to 1.06. Jaeger had broken the sound barrier and hadn't felt a thing. He radioed to the B-29's pilot that his Mach meter must be screwy because he was apparently through the sound barrier without his ears falling off. There's more on the story of the X-1 and the research that preceded that flight in my book, Breaking the Chains of Gravity. I'll have links below if you guys want to order your very own copies. And as a final note, the sound barrier isn't really a barrier per se. It conjures up the idea of a wall in the sky that you have to break through, but really that's not what's happening. The term was actually coined in a newspaper article in the UK. The term was actually coined in a newspaper article in 1935. The reporter had been talking to a pilot about the phenomenon of compressibility, and the pilot had drawn an image showing the air molecules building up in front of a plane, and the way he illustrated it, it looked like a wall. And so the journalist wrote that the sound barrier was like a wall in the sky. If you guys have more questions about the X-1 or other things that fly really fast through the air and through space, leave them in the comments below. And of course, let me know questions and ideas that you would like to see covered on future episodes. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and on Instagram for daily vintage space content. And with new episodes going up right here every single week, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode.